Hi, guys. How was your first week back at school? I agree with her. Did you like the snow day, though? Yes. Yeah. Me, too. I got to sleep in, and I still did homework. <laughs> okay. Anyway, so probably everyone here this morning has sang the song, If You're Happy, right? You know, the one that goes, if you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. If you're happy and you know it, then your face will surely so show it. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. Yeah? No? Yeah. Okay. I wonder how that song would go if it was sung by a bunch of birds. Maybe it'd be like, if you're happy and you know it, flap your wings. Flap, flap. No? Okay. <laughs> what do you think a dog would do if he sang that song? Maybe he'd wag his tail? And it'd go like, if you're happy and you know it, wag your tail. If you're happy and you know it, wag your tail. If you're happy and you know it, then your tail will surely show it. If you're happy and you know it, wag your tail. Yeah? Okay. So, one time, I heard a story about this little puppy that noticed whenever he was happy, his tail wagged. So he thought he found the secret to happiness. One day he shared the secret of happy happiness with an older dog. He said, I have learned that the best thing for a dog is happiness and that happiness is my tail. So I'm going to chase my tail, and when I catch it, I shall have happiness. The old dog replied, I too believe that is in my tail. Oh, I skipped a line. Oh well. But I have noticed that when I chase it, my tail keeps running away from me. But when I go about my business, it keeps following me wherever I go. The Bible has a lot to say about being happy. It doesn't say, happier though are they who have lots of money, or happy are they who live in big houses and drive fancy cars. It doesn't even say, happy are they who only have good things happen to them. What the Bible does say is, happy are the merciful, happy are the peacemakers, and happy are the pure in heart. The Bible also says, happy is he who trusts in the Lord. Many of us are like that little puppy chasing his tail, trying to find true happiness that is always just out of out of our reach. What we need to do is learn that if we will just go about our business and trust in the Lord, happiness will follow us wherever we go. So let's pray. Dear Lord, help us to place our trust in you so that we may experience the happiness that only you can bring. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now Bonnie's going to uh, read to us from uh, my favorite book of the Bible, uh, Romans 8. We know that God works all things together for good for the ones who love God, for those who are called according to his purpose. We know this because God knew them in advance, and he decided in advance that they would be conformed to the image of his son. That way his son would be the first of many brothers and sisters, those who God decided in advance would be conformed to his son. He also called. Those whom he called he also made righteous. Those whom he made righteous he also glorified. So what are we going to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He didn't spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. Won't he also freely give us all things with him? Who will bring a charge against God's elect people? Who is God? It is God who acquits them. Who is going to convict them? It is Christ Jesus who died, even more, who was raised, and who also is at God's right side. It is Christ Jesus who also pleads our case for us. Who will separate us from Christ's love? Will we be separated by trouble, or distress, or harassment, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, we are being put to death all day long for your sake. We are treated like sheep for slaughter. 
But in all these things, we win a sweeping victory through the one who loved us. I'm convinced that nothing can separate us from God's love in Christ Jesus our Lord. Not death or life, not angels or rulers, not present things or future things, not powers or height or depth or any other, any other thing that is created. So ends the reading of God's holy word. Amen. Thank you, Bonnie. You know, as human beings, there's one crazy question that probably um, has come across your mind at one point or another in your lifetime. It may have been when you were just a little tyke, or it may be uh, recent as last week. But that question is, I wonder what I could get away with. I wonder what I could get away with. Last week we started talking about uh, grace, the amazing word of grace, and what grace is. And grace is the unconditional uh, love that God has for us that is completely unmerited. We have no way that we deserve it, but God loves us anyway. It's been said that you cannot sin your way away from God's love, that it's always there. But that grace um, is there to forgive any, anything that we could possibly do. So with that in mind, what can we get away with? What could we do? Are we to live our lives um, uh, recognizing the fact that God's grace is always going to be there so we can continue to do wrong? Um, should we just continue uh, to do the wrong things and never feel any guilt about it or any kind of remorse because of God's unconditional love? Are we never to show grace to others? Should we be walking around all the time with arrogance, with uh, unbridled uh, greed, with dishonesty, with uh, selfishness? Should we walk around that way? Well, why not? Isn't God's grace going to forgive all of these things anyway? So why not do it? Won't his unconditional love trump any kind of sin that we could possibly come up with? Well, the answer to that is yes and no. Let's look at what I mean. There's a story about a gentleman that was riding on a bus. And um, he overheard a conversation between a woman that was sitting next to him and the woman that was sitting across the aisle in the other seat. And they were discussing a book called the Road Less Traveled by Peck. I don't know if anybody has read this book or not, but it's been on the New York Times bestseller list longer than any other book other than the Bible. So the one woman was thumbing through the pages as she was looking to see what the book was kind of all about, and the other woman sitting next to her says, well, what are you reading? And she said, of course, well, it's The Road Less Traveled by uh, Scott Peck. And... Um, she says, well, what's it about? She goes, well, I don't know. I haven't quite read it yet, but my sister gave it to me, said it changed her life. So they were reading through the table of contents, kind of going down through the list here and says, well, there's, there's things on health, there's things on serendipity, uh, there's things on something called grace. And the guy that was sitting next to him said, well, what is grace? And she goes, I don't know. I haven't gotten to grace yet. Now, I think of that line quite often when I look at the evening news and all the turmoil that's going on in France and everywhere else, that the world hasn't gotten to grace yet. Unfortunately, I also think of that line sometimes as we look at some of our churches. A lot of churches have rules and doctrines and things that uh, are not very welcoming to people. Uh, these rules uh, oftentimes show that our churches where we really where you would really think you would find grace you're not finding grace one um, person um, that I know uh, that I used to work with in um, Pennsylvania he and his wife were new to an area in Pennsylvania so they decided to attend a particular church that was uh, not very far from them. So they went there on Sunday morning. And the, as soon as they walked in the door, someone grabbed her and started leading her away because the women don't worship with the men in that church. 
Now, she's a very painfully shy person, and she was not very comfortable with this at all. But Dave said you could always see the uh, anguish on the face of the person trying to get her away because they, women were just not allowed. That was a rule they had, that women were not allowed to worship with the men. So the children that came with them were immediately taken away uh, from the sanctuary, couldn't be in the sanctuary. They had to go to a, a Sunday school class where they sat the whole time, and it was a two-hour service. So that's kind of a rule that says, well, women aren't allowed to worship with the men in our church, so therefore, if they do, then God's probably against that. I mean, that's the conclusion that you, one would draw when you look at some of the rules that these churches have. According to the Gospel of John, the law was given to us through uh, Moses, but grace and truth was given to us through Jesus Christ. But what about grace? Wouldn't it be great instead of having churches with all kinds of rules and stipulations, uh, things like you can't take communion if you're not a member, or you have to separate the men and the women, um, or you have to behave a certain way, you have to dress a certain way in order to feel comfortable in the church and therefore in order to be accepted by God. Wouldn't it be grace, it, great if churches had a contest of some kind, a program where they were trying to outgrace other churches? So you'd have these rivals going back and forth trying to outgrace somebody else. When you see it anywhere, lack of grace, I came up with the word ungrace. I'm not sure if that's even a word or not. It wasn't according to my word document, but the word ungrace. Ungrace is out there. Ungrace is um, throughout our churches and it's throughout our society. There's a story of a, a young uh, prostitute who was really bad off. She had a two-year-old daughter, couldn't have, didn't have enough money to buy food for, and was pretty much down in the dumps, was completely homeless. And someone asked her, was, have you tried to go to a church to get help? And she says, a church? Why would I do that? I feel bad enough as it is. I feel guilty enough as it is. They'll just make me feel worse. You know, I think that happens a lot, where we're not welcoming. We're not showing the grace that God is showing to us. It happens a lot. That story points to the fact that uh, many churches um, are judgmental. They judge based on looks. They judge based on superficial things and not the heart, not looking at the heart. There's another story of a, a couple, a young couple that uh, was going to this particular church, always there every Sunday like clockwork. They had major problems within their marriage and the word was getting out that they were getting divorced. So one Sunday morning, just the wife came with her 15-year-old daughter, and a woman came up to her and said, How in the world can you and your husband both love Christ and still think you can get a divorce? It tore her up. She said if the woman had just come up and gave her a hug and said, I'm sorry to hear what's going on, it would have meant so much. Comments stun the woman. According to Mark Twain, when he talks about people, he says, people are good in the worst sense of the word. Twain also said that he decided to hold an experiment one time. He decided to put a dog and a cat inside of a cage to see if they would get along. They spat for a little bit at first, but eventually the dog and the cat got along okay. So then he decided to put in a, uh, let's see, it's a pig... Um, a bird, a pig, and a goat to see if they would get along. And after a short while, they started to get along in the cage. Then he tried another experiment. He put a Baptist, a Protestant, and a Methodist inside the cage. <laughs> All hell broke loose. <laughs> they did not get along. Today, unfortunately, there's a major divide within the United Methodist Church. And it, um, it can be serious. This divide, we've got one side that says that pastors and bishops should be able to marry same-sex couple, couples. The other side says, no, we can't do that, where our doctrine says we 
uh, will not be allowed to do that. And today that's, that's the case. That's where we are. This divide is so deep because you have so much passion on both sides that it ultimately it could split the United Methodist Church. And it's about 50-50. So we have to wait and see on that one. But um, remember that God instructs us to hate the sin but to love the sinner. That we need to show grace to everyone. Ungrace can also divide nations and families. How many times have you heard the, maybe a father and son arguing, for example, and one of them says, I never want to see you again. And that lasts for 25, 30 years. A major divide within the family. In fact, that divide can be passed on from generation to generation. There's stories of a couple that... Uh, decided to get divorced, but they couldn't agree on who gets the house. So the husband, literally, this is a true story, cut the house in two, boarded up both sides, and each of them live in half the house. Never speaking to one another ever again. Now, just imagine how that is being passed on from generation to generation. We see that a lot of examples where if the parents aren't getting along or if there's some kind of divide, that that can go until uh, grandsons and so on. Once that happens, generations after generation will maintain that ungrace and keep that divide. Maybe you've heard this before. I, I call it the, the infamous uh, parental catch-22, where the kid, little kid comes up and says, I'm sorry, Mom, for doing what I did. I really am. And she says, no, you're not. If you were really sorry, you wouldn't have done it in the first place. That is a catch-22. But that perpetuates ungrace, and ungrace continues. Of course, there are countless examples of countries, of nations, of tribes, of groups of people, of religions that are fighting one another and showing ungrace. And that continues. If you look at the Ukraine today, what Russia is doing, we don't like, so we don't talk to Russia. What others have, have been doing, uh, what one nation says, I'm, like Israel and the Palestinians, they don't talk to one another. That ungrace has been existing for 3,000 years. It is a powerful force, ungrace. But remember that grace is also more powerful. We perpetuate ungrace, and that can be a tricky thing. When we talk about the love and the grace that God has unconditionally for all of us, no matter what we do or who we are, there are some things that, well, are loopholes in that. There's actually some loopholes. There's a catch. As we discussed last week, grace comes free of charge to people who do not deserve it. And I frankly am one of them. Many of us here this morning are people that don't deserve God's grace. But grace is pretty much unfair. Many people and, uh, would find it very difficult for an abused person to forgive the abuser. For example, it's very difficult to show grace. It's unfair. But what's true of families and children and other loved ones is also true throughout the world where ungrace is perpetuated. But the only thing that's more difficult than forgiveness, the only thing that's more difficult than forgiveness is the alternative. It's to maintain that hatred. It's to maintain that divide within a family or within churches or between churches or nations or tribes or groups of people or other religions. Maintaining that hatred is a lot harder. You remember years ago during the Los Angeles riots, a guy, a truck driver by the name of Reginald Denny was pulled out of his truck, thrown to the ground and hit in the face by, with bricks and was kicked. 
severely beaten. During the trial, when he was up on the stand, you could still see his caved-in face. And big stitches that went all the way around his head. And against his lawyer's advice, and against everybody else's advice, he went up to his accused attackers and their mothers and said, I forgive you. If you remember how badly beaten he was, how hard that would have been to say, I forgive you, but he did. The mothers hugged him and said, we love you. That divide is not, was not maintained. Forgiveness can break the chain of ungrace. As hard and unfair as an unnatural, truly unnatural as it seems, offering grace and forgiveness to wrongdoers actually sets you free. Forgiving is easier than maintaining the hatred. There's another story of a teenager that was attending church, spent the, the whole hour there in church, and afterwards he came up to the pastor and he said, Pastor, you know, this Christianity thing, to live like a Christian, that, that's really hard. The pastor looked at him and said, no, it's not hard. It's impossible. And here's the loophole. Here's the catch. It's impossible to do it by yourself. You must open your heart and accept Christ into your life. And when that happens, anything is possible. Anything is possible. The loophole is that in order to receive the grace of God, you've got to go through Christ to get it. And when you go through Christ to get it, you do not do the wrong things anymore. Or, but if you do, you've got the forgiveness and love of Christ right there with you when, you happen, when it happens. That's the loophole in God's unconditional love and grace. Receiving it, accepting it, comes through Christ. Here's another true story out of Australia. A prisoner was sentenced to life imprisonment in a maximum security prison in a small island off the coast of Australia. And life was so difficult there that while he was there, he grabbed uh, another inmate, started beating him, and killed the inmate, the other inmate, beat him to death. They took him off the island, took him over to the mainland and, uh, before a judge, and the judge says, why did you do that? He said, well, life is so bad in that prison that I didn't want to be there anymore. The judge said, well, why didn't you just take your own life? He said, well, if I did that, I would go straight to hell. This way I can kill somebody else and beg for forgiveness, and I won't do that. He got the death penalty, but that's how, that was his rationale. The fact that he abused or exploited God's grace. You see, to oversimplify people in the world, people can be put into two groups. And it's not two groups that you think about, where you have the, the guilty and the righteous, the good and the bad. It's not that. Everybody is guilty. Every one of us is guilty. But the two groups that you can divide the guilty people into are those that admit their wrongdoings and those that don't. Those that accept Christ turn themselves in to God by turning their life over in complete surrender to Christ. And you've got the others that continue to do wrongdoings, that don't admit their um, mistakes, that don't take it to Christ. The one that turns themselves in to God and admit their wrongs can accept grace. And they can, are clear completely to receive it. During the building of the Golden Gate Bridge out of San Francisco, as they were building the bridge, they had many unfortunate accidents happen. Some of the workers were working in fear because a few of them had fallen off the bridge and fell to their death as they were building it. And of course, the people that were building it uh, said, this is costing us a lot in time and delays. And the men are not working right because they're more concerned about their safety than they are about getting the bridge done. 
He didn't know what to do. So one of them had, a, had an idea. He says, well, why don't we just put up a great big net underneath the bridge as we build it? And if any of them fall, the net will catch them before they hit the water. And at first they laughed at that solution, but then they realized that's pretty good. So they did that. They put the net underneath as they were building the bridge. Men fell, but not to their death. They were caught by the net and saved. The men became more productive as they were uh, building the bridge because they weren't working in fear. That's the way God's grace is. Well, if you fall off and make that mistake and take it to Him, God's grace is there for you. God's unconditional love is there for you. Think of the safety net. Finally, one last story. Guy went to uh, heaven. He was a good man. Went to heaven. St. Peter's there talking to him at the gate. He says, okay, you need a thousand points to get into heaven. He says, well, how do I get a thousand points? He says, well, you've got to go through what you did in life. And we assign points to those. And if you get up to a thousand, you're coming in. The guy thought for a minute. He says, well, I, t- I taught Sunday school for 40 years. The guy said, okay. And Peter said, okay, that's worth one point. He says, well, I also was very loving and faithful uh, husband and father to my kids. And uh, uh, St. Pete says, okay, that's, that's worth one point. He said, well, I, I tithed every Sunday. I gave 10% of my income to the church. St. Peter said, that's very good too. You get one more point. He thought for a little bit more and didn't know what to what he's going to come up with. And finally he said, okay, well, I was deacon and I served on the board on my church. And St. Peter says, well, that's worth a half a point. (laughs) Put that on there. The guy's getting totally frustrated. He says, how many points do I have? And St. Pete says, you've got 12. He had no more things to do. He was totally frustrated. He said, my word, the only way that you can get into heaven these days is by the pure grace of God. And the guy says, that's a thousand points, come in. (laughs) That's the only way. It doesn't doesn't matter what you do in life. It's what you accept. It's what's been done for you. Not what you've done, but what's been done for you that matters. That's where the grace comes from. If we currently could just spend our time and our energy and try to understand God's unconditional love and grace for us. If we could put our energies there and try to understand it and not exploit it. The crazy question of, I wonder what I can get away with, won't even occur to us. Grace is the most wonderful gift that we as Christians can give to the world. Wouldn't it be great that Christians develop this culture of grace and forgiveness that the world adopts? You would not perpetuate ungrace, but you can perpetuate grace from generation to generation. What a gift. Amen.